I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. If Jesus was the Son of God and the Savior of the world, why was he baptized? While a seemingly trivial question, Christians have struggled for centuries to articulate who Jesus is and what he was about. In a way, like the crowds Luke mentions at the start of today's Gospel reading, we've longed for a Savior, for someone to give us hope in our times of trial and tribulation. You might be even yearning for one today as we seem to be caught in a never-ending cycle of pandemic lockdowns and daily counts of thousands of people falling ill from the virus. I know I have. In fact, just the other day I found myself questioning God and demanding an answer from him. When are you going to help us? Lord, save us. Well, no, no immediate response was given to my petition. Maybe that's a good thing, to be honest. <laughs> I don't know if I always want that. My prayer has lingered in my heart. Where is God in all of this? What is God up to? And what has changed since that first Christmas when love came down and that day when Jesus was immersed in the waters of the River Jordan? I'm not the first to raise these questions. As I said in the beginning of the sermon, Christians have long wrestled with Jesus' identity. Well, the church has affirmed Jesus' divinity and humanity, and how that plays out in his life is another matter for discussion. And as you may have noticed, there's little in the four Gospels about Jesus' early life. In a matter of two weeks, we go, the story takes us from the babe in a manger to a man waiting in the waters of the Jordan. With the exception of the adolescent Jesus being found in the temple, we know very little about Jesus' life before he was well an adult. Did Jesus know who he was? Did he grow and yearn as you and I do? According to Luke, Jesus did develop and grow in a way similar to us. Luke tells us that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and God's people. Some Christians have been uneasy with the idea that Jesus grew in understanding of who he was and what he was about. I, however, find it deeply consoling and appealing. As I shared at Christmas Eve, God embraced the fullness of our humanity and humbled God's self so as to transform and redeem us fully and completely. And God did so because God loves us totally and completely. But that still doesn't answer the questions about what God is up to and why do we still find ourselves immersed in a world of pain and suffering? If God did redeem the world by becoming like one of us and dying for us on the cross, then why haven't things quite changed? Who really was Jesus? Well, these are legitimate and good questions. I think there is something worth considering and Jesus' act of taking on the fullness of our humanity and the human experience, and by stepping into the waters of Jordan, God becomes one of us. And not just one of us, but one with us. Jesus' baptism is an act of solidarity with us. It is also the moment when we become one with Jesus and his ministry, Jesus' baptism, his life and ministry are invitations to us 
to share in the great work of redemption. We are called to participate in God's loving transformation of the world. God wants us to be part of the story and to work through us to make known his love for all people. God does not act alone, for it is not in the nature of love to act alone. Rather, God works with us to trans to manifest and make known his loving grace and power. Although God may seem distant at times, I wonder if that's less a reflection of God and more of our own personal response to God. Don't get me wrong, God can be incredibly evasive and I'll be honest, annoying. <laughs> Yet I found that God is more present to me when I'm sharing in God's great work of love, caring for the sick and the suffering, walking with the joyful and the sorrowful, and simply being a faithful witness of God's everlasting love for us. This has been particularly so this past week. I'll fully admit that by Wednesday night I was discouraged that we were once again limited to live streaming our worship and not able to welcome all into this building. But then I wondered, maybe God is pushing me a little, trying to get me to think of new ways of serving God's people and going outside of my comfort zone. Maybe we need to get out of our churches and into the streets and be in solidarity with all God's people, just as Jesus became one with us in his baptism. I don't know whether that is the answer or not, but a remembrance of Jesus' baptism and our personal experience might just be an invitation for us to step up and become ministers of God's love, justice, and peace in a world that is broken, wounded, and in pain. Might this be the occasion for us to be truly church, the living body of Jesus Christ in the world today, to manifest in word and deed the gracious and everlasting love of God through compassionate care and acts of mercy? Funny enough, as I was pondering this question and reflecting upon what I share with you today, our music director, Mervyn, came by my office to talk about the anthem for after the sermon. And much to my surprise and delight, Mervyn proposed the choir sing an anthem based upon a poem by Howard Thurman and set to music by Dan Forrest. Thurman, for those of you who don't know, was perhaps one of the greatest theologians, preachers, and social justice activists in the 20th century. If you ever get to read one of his many books, I encourage you to do so. His poem and the musical setting of it, which we will hear in a few moments, points us in the direction that I suggest today. That after all the wonder and awe of Christmas, now is the time for us to get to work. Thurman's poem says it the best, and I quote, when the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flock, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among brothers, to make music, from the heart. Although the pandemic has made things more complicated, let us not step back from our ministry. Now is a time when our community, our city, our country, and the world needs us to be church. Now is a time for us to be in solidarity with the suffering and the weak, the isolated and the marginalized. Now is the time for us to be Jesus and to proclaim hope and freedom to all. Sure, we may have to find new ways of ministering to God's people, but let us not recoil from our mission, 
but renew our commitment to be the ministers of God's grace and peace to all. Amen.